good evening. Uh, my name's Cor Shimoleski. It's a big, long last name. I don't expect you to spell it. I um, want to welcome you. I'm the pastor here at Hope. Been so, been doing so for a while now. Really enjoy, really enjoy ministering here at Hope. Uh, really appreciate uh, you guys. Appreciate uh, the leaders of this church and, and what we're trying to do and where we're trying to go as a church. And uh, one of the things that was laid upon the heart of Steve was the desire to speak to the topic of sexuality. And it's been great. And it's been a kick to get into the song of Solomon. And that's something that we're going to continue two weeks from now. Uh, next week because we'll be at Spring Retreat. All right. Some, some of you, some of you are there. You heard that. Some of you needed a second reminder. Um, but we've been in this series. We're going to continue on in this series. But for three weeks, we've taken a break to look at the topic of false intimacy. Because as we look at Song of Solomon... We see it, and we can appreciate it, and recognize that we might not be experiencing it. That rather than getting God's design and God's example, God's blueprint for our lives, we've settled for a knockoff and a counterfeit. And as a result of that, brokenness and pain and frustration, perhaps loneliness and alienation has come into your life. It has come into my life, and it just left us befuddled in a mess. Week one, we talked about the consequence of pornography, how like a canyon, it just gets grooved in your brain. The more you do it, the less likely a healthy, godly Song of Solomon impulse comes in and lands as it should. What's most likely to happen is that is going to get hijacked and derailed and warped and twisted. And so as we consume that stuff, it puts us in a position where we cannot cannot see God's design, a Song of Solomon opportunity, perhaps a future spouse, because we're so broken and our minds become so corrupted. Last week we talked about the lines of true intimacy. We talked about the monkeys and, uh, <laughs> and coloring and stuff. No, we, we, we took time to look at 10 scriptural lines for true intimacy. In the book of Genesis, Song of Solomon, 1 Corinthians, we took time to unpack the different lines, the lines that God has drawn for true intimacy, and to the degree that we're going to draw outside these lines, or not acknowledge these lines. I think it's to our harm, it's to our detriment. God has given us true north. He's given us what we need to experience true intimacy. We tackled three tough issues, and as we did that, I, I, I tried to encourage us as a church to be mindful that it's not just the issue. Yes, the issue is important. What does God say about fill in the blank? It's critical. It's important. But it's not the only piece. The manner in which we speak about these things with our friends, with our family, our coworkers, and our classmates is as important as the issue. Truth is not a club that you get to come and just whack you over the head of your neighbor. It's not what God would intend. But to deal with it carefully and wisely. It's not that we deny or relax truth, but as we speak truth, we do so with care, compassion, love, gentleness, having the other person's interests in our minds as we do this. So in theology, as you're talking through stuff, the matter and the matter, manner, both matter. And then I close with asking a couple questions. What are the lines that you see in your life because of your family of origin? Because what you've been told about this subject, because of the pieces you've picked up in culture, what are the lines? What's the picture that you see? And as we held up God's blueprint and God's picture, as you see your picture and his picture, and they don't overlap 100%, are you willing to flex to him? Are you willing to adjust to God's design for your life and his desires for sexuality? This has stirred, and I knew it would. It has stirred you guys. I have not received as much email for any of the other sermons. You guys like sex. Uh, and, and this topic, and you want to talk about it. And many of you really appreciate the openness that we have at Hope. And that, that's not changing. We want to encourage you. We want to come alongside you. We want to engage you in the issues. One person emailed me. Started out the email by saying this, I hope this email goes to the right person, to the man who preached Sunday night, March 27th, on the topic of sexuality 
outside the lines. She found the right guy. That was me, all right? Go, I don't know where this is going. Let me keep reading here. We went to Hope, uh, her and her boyfriend, went to Hope Community for the first time this last Sunday, March 27th. When he started talking about homosexuality, I was disagreeing with your point of view. I respected it, but disagreed. Because of what you had to say about homosexuality, I did not want to come back to Hope. We, my boyfriend and I, talked about this on our walk back to my place, and during dinner, we both didn't feel like going back to Hope. In a place of saying, we just disagree with you guys. Okay? We disagree with where Hope's at, where the elders are at. We flat out are in different places. We don't see things the way you do. Our filter, your filter, they're different, and therefore we interpret things differently, and we end up with different scenarios. If you haven't had the chance to sermon, I encourage you to look at that online, but we knew that this was a possibility, that there would be disagreement on these issues. And one of the things that I tried to communicate was, it's okay to disagree. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about how you got to where you're at and how we got to where we're at, and let's see what the Bible has to say on this. Because Bible for us at Hope is true north. And as much as I want God to adjust to me, he's calling me to adjust to him in the scriptures. But they were in a place of disagreeing with hope. But not only that, we both felt defeated, broken down, torn apart. Now she, she switched topics. She's actually speaking about their relationship, how they felt in their relationship because of what was preached on. What you had to say had me still thinking about it the next morning. We talked about it Monday evening for a long time. I said that of all the churches that we have been visiting, Hope Community is the only one that has challenged us, got us to think, and question what we are doing. It was a hard sermon to hear. That feeling of being defeated is not fun, but we appreciate the challenge. We feel that is what it should be about, even though it isn't easy. And so in our, the dialogue over email that followed this up, she was talking to me, almost rhetorically, kind of saying, we don't know if we're going to come back. We disagree with what you guys believe. And not only that, we walked away feeling challenged, not just challenged, but defeated, broken down, and torn apart. And then I talked to him after second service today. They came back. I'm like, you disagreed with what I had to say. And not, you, you felt bad. You've, other churches, they didn't challenge. They talked about happy things, good thoughts. And you came back to hope. What are you doing? Why'd you do that? And I wanted to champion. We're going we're gonna to talk through about what we disagree about. And we're going to keep challenging the people of hope from God's word. But I think this person's example, she wanted to just walk out. I said, why didn't you then? Uh, my, my boyfriend was at the end of the pew, and I couldn't get out. Like, <laughs> praise Jesus. All right, here we go. Uh, <laughs> but she stayed and willing to engage. And I find that very uncommon. Per perhaps I'm a little jaded from the politics that we, I see in this country, but usually there's two monologues going on. I don't necessarily see dialogue happen. So I was just thankful. And I want to encourage you. Maybe you've been in a place where you're disagreeing with something you see at Hope. And you don't feel like you can say something. I want to invite that. Got to keep the emails to a certain word limit. But uh, no, no. We want to invite that. We want to dialogue about these things. Even things you might disagree with. But then the other part of her email. Feeling defeated, broken down, and torn apart. Some of you, due to sexual sin, are right there with her. You're right there. You feel, even as you come back, you, 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 you want to come back. You want to hear how this series might end. You're hoping to find your way out, but you're doubtful. 
you feel so defeated, the darkness is so overwhelming, you don't think that this could actually happen. And so we want to spend the rest of our time talking about what does it look like to move forward from false intimacy. It was originally entitled Redemption from False Intimacy. I, I, I didn't change it because I don't like redemption. I'm, I'm still a big fan of redemption. Um, but I didn't want to miscommunicate that if you just receive the redemption of God, then you're done. If you just do this and think about these things after service, maybe you go through the process of communion or baptism, that boom, I've arrived. And no longer am I going to struggle with that. But for some of us, we have spent years and years and years journeying into sin. And it may take weeks, months, even years to journey out of it. I'm not trying to discourage you. I'm trying to be real with you. Our minds, for some of us, have become very warped. We have so lived for ourselves that it's very hard and it takes much time and effort to start living for God in all areas of our life. And so what I'm going to bring forward in the next minutes is not a three-step deal. We talked about that. Don't think there's three steps. But what I'm going to talk about is three stages that I think we cycle through often, repeatedly, maybe many times a day in our struggle against sin and against sexual sin. Three stages that I think we need to be willing to cycle through. It's not a one and you're done. So what are those three things? Number one, acknowledge what God already knows. See the picture there from Castaway? You see what it says in the background? Help, you know. Uh, stranded on a des desert island, I need help. And in this area of our lives, acknowledging what God already knows, that we need help. My guess is, if you're struggling with sexual sin, if you're anything like me and like uh, my struggle, you've tried to fix this on your own. You've tried many times. You've employed many ways to try and help yourself. You lack self-control, and yet you still try and exercise self-control. And you keep it with yourself. And you try again, and you try again. But you're out of control. And getting to the point where we will just throw up our hands and acknowledge that we need help. And as I was thinking through this, acknowledging what God already knows, why is this important? If God already knows, what's the big deal? This idea of confessing and acknowledging, owning the fact that we're sinners. Owning the fact that we struggle with sexual sin. Jesus made it very important. It's a very important point in Luke chapter 5, verses 30 to 32. Read with me. But the Pharisees... The teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to Jesus' disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now what Jesus was not doing was making a judgment about these religious leaders. He wasn't saying, ah, ah, I'm over here. This is where the sinners are. The tax collectors and the prostitutes and those hang out with them. There's the sinners. But, but you guys, you're the religious leaders. You don't need me. You're good. You're righteous. He wasn't doing that. He was making a point that there's no acknowledgement. You guys don't even realize that you're sick. You're not even entertaining the idea that you could be unrighteous. These people get it. They understand all too well that they're living in darkness. The piece of acknowledging what God already knows is important for you. For me. It's so important. Look what it says in 1 John 1. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. If we're unwilling to own this, if we're willing to say, no, I'm good, no sin here, God says you're deceived. Across this room, your struggle may look different. Somebody may even of this week or this month confess to you something darker, more unnatural, 
than what you're experiencing. But every one of us, I would say our lives in some form or fashion have been tainted by sin in the sexual area. Something works in our mind, something's gotten into our heart, and as a result, we're not operating according to God's plan and design in this area. We claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, we make God out to be a liar. Why? He knew sin would be a problem, and so he sent a sin solution through Christ. We claim to be without sin, we claim to not need a sin solution, we make God out to be a liar. It's just so critical for us to acknowledge what God already knows. What we ourselves may already know, but are willing to, unwilling to own. This is so important that Harry Schomburg, in, in his book on false intimacy, talks about moving forward. In his five points, the first four deal with just acknowledgement. I'm a sinner. Face, realize, deal. Will you acknowledge what God already knows? He's saying this is so important that of the five points I'm going to list, four of them are just getting us to do that. This is step one, and if we don't do step one, then we're not going to get to steps two and three on this journey. Are you, am I, willing to acknowledge our helpless state? Look at uh, how Tom Hanks' character frames his helpless state. He's recounting at the end of the story, if you remember the end of the movie, he's recounting the tale about how helpless he was. We had both done the math. Kelly, his girlfriend or fiance, added it up. And knew she had to let me go. She had to go on with her life. I added it up on the island. And knew that I had lost her. Because I was never going to get off that island. I was going to die there. Totally alone. I was going to get sick. Or get injured or something. The only choice I had. The only thing I could control. Was when I was going to die. How I was going to die. And where it was going to happen. So I made myself a rope. I went up to the summit to hang myself. But I had to test it, you know. Shares a bit of his personality here. You know me. And the weight of the log snapped the limb of the tree. So I couldn't even kill myself the way I wanted. I had power. Many of us have been deceived for far too long thinking we have this under control. In this area of sexual sin, I don't care what the struggle is. You fill in the blank. What is your sexual struggle? Have you bought into the deception, the lie that you have power over this thing? That you got it under control? Or are you willing to acknowledge what God already knows? Are you willing to admit, to own this? Put up your hand and say, I need help. I need help. Will someone help me? I need help. Maybe take it one step further. This is where it gets risky. It gets risky for us, okay? Are you willing to actually share that with another person? Everybody needs a Wilson. Remember Wilson? <laughs> Best supporting actor. Uh, <laughs> not a lot of actors in this movie. Are you willing to open yourself up? Be vulnerable, honest, transparent with another person. This is risky, even in the church. To share with another person, a mentor, somebody you look up to, a small group leader, small group to actually acknowledge the fact. I'm out of control. This has power over me. I don't have power over this thing. Things are happening. I'm... I'm, I'm confessing and saying to myself, I'll never do that again. And then the next night, the next weekend, it happens again and again and again. This is risky. And as much as as you share sensitive information, it would be my hope that the person you're sharing it would respond with sensitivity. Sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes, unfortunately, we experience friendly fire. From one another. Maybe judgment where you're expecting grace. Maybe truth and you experience just an overwhelming, just glossing over the issue. I made a mistake this week. Um, Somebody had come to me in confidence 
and said, hey, I want to get hooked up with somebody at Hope. I want to, would it be okay if you and I got coffee? And I replied back and said, you know what, my schedule's not going to allow for that, but I, I got a great guy. Can I connect you with him? You know, can I have your permission to share kind of, hey, uh, the struggle and, and, you know, connect the two of you guys. And before that permission had been returned to me, I was granted permission from another guy to connect him with somebody else at Hope. And my wires got crossed. And they ended up moving forward. And this guy was hurt. He was appropriately hurt. Because I was moving forward and I had not yet received permission back from him. And so unintentionally wounded this guy, apologized, tried to explain uh, what had happened. And he was above reproach, uh, totally gracious, extended forgiveness to me, felt very, um, yeah, just really appreciated that. But it's not as you go and move forward into other people's lives, it's not a matter of if you're going to get hurt. It's when. We will hurt one another. Yet, the reward, the band of brotherhood or sisterhood that you can find, in my mind, the reward is worth the risk. That what that can do for you is worth putting yourself out there. So acknowledge what God already knows. Number two, receive what God has already given. Receive what the Lord has given. You see the, the boat kind of coming behind Tom Hanks there. Going to pick him up. What has God already given us? Let's go to John chapter 1. It says the true light, and we've been talking about what's false. The true light, Jesus Christ, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet, to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children not born of natural descent, or human decision, or husband's will, but born of God. This is the opportunity that is extended to every single person in this room. If you want, you can receive the gift of Jesus Christ through belief, through trust. This is a gift that's already been extended to you. Ever since he went to the cross and was raised again, he extends this gift to every one of us. I skipped verse 9 from earlier from 1 John. He says this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. From all unrighteousness. Some of you are chuckling. You're like, I knew you missed verse 9. He was going to come back to it. I knew that. If we confess our sins, not one time for all time, in an ongoing manner, keeping short accounts with God, working it through. Yes, we needed this to start our relationship with Jesus Christ. Some of you maybe did that with a mom or a dad, four or five years old. You said, I want to follow Jesus. Some of you later in life, Yet this is one of the things that we have as a promise. Confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us. What a gospel promise. In this area of sexual sin where struggle is rampant, it's there, it's present, to realize, God, I can come to you. Acknowledge what you already know. And because of your character and who you say you are, you're faithful to forgive me. To cleanse me from all unrighteousness. That's the gospel. That is something that you received that you didn't deserve. You couldn't have conceived of the gospel. Even before coming to Christ, somebody would ask you, what do you think you need to get into heaven? You would have said, be better. Try harder. Be more loving. That's the best that we can conceive of with our minds. And God says, I got something better. I'm going to send my son into the world. And though people were made by him, they're not going to recognize him. His imprint is on their life on their mind, on their heart, on their soul, and they're not even going to recognize him. But those who do, who receive him, believe him, you can become children of God, receiving a spirit not of slavery, but of adoption as sons and daughters to be invited into the family of God. That's the gospel message. That's what we cling to here at Hope. That is all we preach, week after week after week. We flash different logos up there, but it's the gospel. That's the only message we have. And so I want to encourage you, don't graduate out of that. Don't move forward and just say, well, no, I've heard that before. 
I'm growing up into maturity. I need something different. This is it. This is what we come back to again and again. So don't outgrow it. Don't forget about it. Don't grow cold. Your heart will want to grow cold to this. Stay sensitive to the beauty and the wonder of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Say, Pastor, I'm there. I'm there, and the struggle's still there. I've done this. I've acknowledged. I've confessed. I've received forgiveness, and I still struggle. Maybe you've actually shared that. You've gone and, and taken the risky part, shared that in a small group. And you say, what's going on? Somebody help me. And maybe one of the responses has been, you know what? You just need to pray more. It just seems like maybe your faith is just a little too weak. And you've started buying into that, thinking, man, if I were just stronger, if I was just stronger in the faith, then I wouldn't struggle with this. I want to reflect. I want to hold something up to you. If you have your sinful nature and you put that in the middle of many of the circumstances that we will in, can you flip back one? And you flip and, and, and you take those, that sinful nature and put it in a certain set of circumstances like sitting yourself in front of a computer for hours looking at porn, okay? Or you put yourself in a situation with your boyfriend or girlfriend or maybe somebody you just met and it's all intimate and dark, you put your sinful nature in those circumstances, those are recipes for disaster. You're putting yourself in the lion's den. It's not that your faith is too weak, your flesh, your sinful nature is too weak to be put in those circumstances. List your spiritual heroes, one through five. Take them. They have a sinful nature. They might be great, godly people. They still have a sinful nature. If you put that same person in the circumstances, in the scenarios that you are putting yourself in, they will fall and fail. Their sinful nature would not be able to bear up under that. And if they're really, really godly, they just say, I can't handle this. I'm out of here. Immediately they just say, I can't do that. I can't intake that. I can't look at that and still remain pure. Or I can't engage in that way as you're doing with your boyfriend or girlfriend and to think that it's not going to progress down the road to sexual immorality. With regard to our sinful nature, there is no sanctification plan. Our sinful nature is hell-bent against God. It, has, it wants nothing to do with God. It wants to pull you away from Him. And as much as you want to say, sinful nature, just make it easy on me. Just change. It won't. It's against God. And the Bible says you don't try and reason with it. You crucify the flesh with its sinful passions. You kill it. You cut it off. You gouge at an eye. You cut off an arm. You crucify your sinful nature. Because it is weak. And it's against God. And it will betray you when you put it in those kind of circumstances. talked uh, uh, and given examples of, of several different sexual sins and uh, didn't get the chance to address uh, the issue of unplanned pregnancy and abortion. Um, if statistics hold true, um, somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, might be a, maybe a handful of you, maybe more, maybe two handfuls of you have experienced that. Maybe you are the woman who has gone in uh, for the procedure Maybe you are the boyfriend or the husband of somebody that's gone through an abortion. Uh, we partner with First Care, and First Care, that's a picture from, if you've been over on East Bank, Chipotle, Brugger's there. First Care is right there on Oak Street, just a couple down from Brugger's. Uh, great ministry, ministry that my wife served at. We're partners uh, in ministry with them. Uh, if you flip to the next slide, is that you, Maggie? Are you back there? Who is that? Hi. Hi. Um, this is a great list of all the different um, things that they offer from free pregnancy tests, uh, counseling, they have social workers on staff, ultrasound ministry, uh, adoption services, crisis counseling, and post-abortive care uh, through a group called Conquerors. And uh, 
there's a lots of ministries that I could uh, highlight. I did actually in the study guide. Um, those of you that are in small groups kind of are talking this through in the study guides listed. Um, some ministries there. Um, there's a lot that we're going to want to do in-house with you here at, at Hope. But if you find yourself in a place where you want to talk with someone and you don't feel safe, whether it's in your small group, talking about this for whatever reason, we come across in church these quote-unquote unspeakable sins. I could never, could never share that with somebody. Perhaps First Care or a ministry of its kind would encourage you to move forward in acknowledging what's already happened, receiving afresh the gospel in that area of your life. And that's just highlighted that. We haven't highlighted um, that struggle with regard to sexual sin, but look, you fill in the blank. Um, we want to come alongside you. We're willing to help you. First Care is one that can do that. So we want to acknowledge what God already knows. We want to receive what God's already given, and we want to live what God's already promised. Live what God's already promised. It's not just do, like whatever you feel like doing. We want to respond to gospel promise. It's going to take a, a second to explain that, but let's go back to Castaway here. See how our buddy's Tom's doing. Okay, right after he got done, he said, I have power over nothing. He keeps going, he said. When I got to that point of acknowledging I had power over nothing, no control, that's when this feeling came over me like a warm blanket. I knew somehow that I had to stay alive. Somehow, somehow I had to keep breathing. Even though there was no reason to hope. And all my logic said that I would never see this place again. So that's what I did. I stayed alive. I kept breathing. And one day, my logic was proven all wrong because the tide came in and gave me a sail. And now, here I am. I'm back in Memphis talking to you. I have ice in my glass. If you remember, that was like a big deal. Like, there's a, you're on a desert island, you don't get ice, you know? It's a big deal for him. And I've lost her all over again. Talking about his then girlfriend, fiance, remar uh, marrying a different guy. He says, I'm so sad that I don't have Kelly. But I'm so grateful that she was with me on that island. And I know what I have to do now. I got to keep breathing. Because tomorrow the sun will rise. Who knows what the tide could bring? As gospel people, we understand what the tide has brought in. We understand what Jesus Christ has done. We've talked about that. We'll continue to talk about what God has done. And yet some of you in the place, with regard to your fight and struggle and sexual sin, that this is what you need to do. Keep breathing. Keep fighting. Keep moving. Some of you are so despondent, you feel so broken, so defeated, so torn up that you've actually entertained ideas of suicide. You've considered that as an option. You've come to a crossroads in your life and you're saying to yourself, I got a couple options. And one of the solutions may be to be done. I just want to be done. It's never going to get better. I'm never going to experience normal life like I see other people experiencing. The tide has brought in the gospel, and God has communicated many gospel promises that as Christians we hang our hats on and we live by. What is a promise? Wiktionary told me. Um, a transaction between two people whereby the first person undertakes in the future to render some service or gift to the second person. This book is a book of promises that God has made to you and to me. And he says, I will not betray my word. If I have said it, if I have promised it, it will come to fruition. Hold me to it. Try me on this. Test me and see if I don't hold true to my word. So what are the promises that you're living by, that you're swearing by, 
that you are patiently enduring evil, waiting upon the deliverance and redemption of the Lord for. Redemption spiritually happens in a moment, and then freedom working itself out in our lives on the path of sanctification toward eternal life. The example Abraham gives us is articulated in Romans 4. He did not weaken in faith. He's given the promise, right? You're going to have a son. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. Okay, put those two together, add those up, and that equals for Abraham no weakening in his faith. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. What has God promised you? What are those gospel promises that you are having in front of you daily, moment by moment, as temptation comes across your path, as opportunities to choose sexual sin enter into your world, What are those gospel promises that you're putting in front and saying, I'm banking on this. God, I'm holding you to your word. I'm trusting you for this. I got a couple of big promises, a couple of BPs. Not that BP. They made a disaster of the golf. All right. There's There's an analogy in there. God does not with his big promises and his BP, he doesn't fail me. All right. All right. <laughs> Galatians 5, 16 and 17. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you don't want to do. So for me, I cling to this. If I'm walking in the Spirit, I know, I'm guaranteed biblically that I won't be living in the flesh. That's a promise that I hold to. It's a big promise. And so I'm seeking to live in the Spirit. Not with regard to sexual sin. Yes, it includes that with regard to all sin. What is my command? What am I trying to do? What am I aiming for in carrying out and living out these gospel promises? Walk, live by God's Spirit. Keep in step with that spirit. How do I see the spirit moving? Spirit, what are you speaking to me today? How do you want me to respond to this person, to that conversation, to this email? Spirit of God, where are you at work? Where am I seeing you in the lives of other people at Hope? Where am I seeing that you need to come and move in people's lives? And I'm thinking about that, and I'm living for him. And as I'm doing that, I am biblically promised that you won't, I won't be gratifying the desires of the sinful flesh, of the sinful nature. Love that promise. Another one from 1 John 3. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is. Future hope. That one day, the veil will be ripped away, faith will become sight, we'll see Jesus as he is. And as a result, we will be like him. No more sinful nature. No more flesh waging war against God. But intimately connected, in harmony with our God. And the promise I hold to is, as I can do that, as, as much as I can see God, Jesus, in his word, understanding, getting to know him. The promise is you will be like him. Putting Jesus in front of me, great Bible promise I hold to often. And so we're left with these things, acknowledging what God already knows, receiving what God's already given, and living what God's already promised. Now wait a second. I thought we were going to talk about moving forward from false intimacy to true intimacy. False intimacy is involved me and, and, and a, a computer, or me and another person, and I've entered into false intimacy. I thought you were going to fix it and bring about true intimacy. This is where we start. 
my belief and my understanding is that for you to experience false intimacy in your sexuality, it has got to see, at its seed, in its starting point, that there was some brokenness in your relationship with God. Some alienation, some loneliness, something entered into that relationship with God, and all of a sudden you felt like you needed something else. And so you ventured into sin to find it. You, invent, you uh, ventured into sexual sin to try and bring about something that you desired, that you felt like God was keeping from you. And so this is where we start. We start with cycling through these things of acknowledging what God already knows, receiving what he's already given, and living with what he's already promised us. Getting our relationship right with God is priority number one. And then we'll see how the rest of Song of Solomon unfolds with regard between a man and a woman, between a husband and a wife. False intimacy. It's about our relationship with God. So moving forward, we find ourselves at the crossroads, just like Tom Hanks at the end of the movie. Remember that? He's got one package delivery. He opened up all the packages except for one. That's how he found Wilson, right? Got a buddy. This lady pulls over, kind of gives him instructions about where each road would take him. You go to this road, you follow it long enough, you get to California. You go this road, take you north, got a whole lot of nothing between here and Canada. That's us, yo. <laughs> that's, that's us. Like, we're a whole lot of nothing, uh, according to this Hollywood producer and director. Um, but right now, some of you are failing, defeated, broken down, torn apart, at a crossroads. Some of you are like me, a year and a half into my walk with Christ, somewhere in there. I think it was about a year and a half, 97, but before I graduated in 2000, in there. Um, I was cycling through this, these three pieces here, just acknowledging, receiving a fresh God's gift, Remembering that, asking God to restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Trying to live out his gospel promises. Struggle, failure, sin, brokenness. Do it again. Acknowledge God. Live for the gospel. Respond. Cling to those gospel promises. Fail, struggle, sin, brokenness, darkness. Just think about hanging it up. God, I don't, I don't want this. I don't want to do this day after day after day. Acknowledging my sin, receiving a fresher gift, clinging to promises, falling into sin, acknowledging my sin, receiving your. I'm tired of it. I just want to be done. For some of you, that is an option you may be considering tonight. That one of the roads is leaving the faith, chucking this thing. Forget about it. Too tough. And I hope we've tried to be real honest that the gospel does not give you a promise of an easy life. In fact, the words of Jesus are, carry your cross. Pick it up, carry it daily. We talk about it being valuable and worth it in the end, but not easier. Some of you are at a crossroads and you're considering that. Other people see the road of the gospel. You see that. You hear me even beckoning you down this road. Come this way. Here's the gospel. And you say, I've already been down that road. Didn't work. I'm here to say that the gospel is the solution to your problems. It is able to bring forth the change you're looking for. All the different sins that I've mentioned throughout this series, we have example after example after example of God's grace coming into the life, human heart, mind, and changing their life. Not void of struggle, but clear transformation over time, fighting daily, living out gospel promises, when failing, acknowledging it, coming before, receiving that gift again. Keep breathing. Keep moving. 
The sun's going to come up tomorrow. God's grace, God's mercy is new every day. We keep going. Some of you are looking at that crossroad. And you just want to sit because you're just so done. You're done trying. You're tired. You're worn out. You feel like you've had this conversation. You feel like you've shared with small group after small group after small group, mentor after mentor. And you don't want to do anything. This is tough. False intimacy, brokenness, those words aren't just words. You feel that, and it's changed you. It's changed your mind and your heart, and you're wondering, will I ever be done? I don't know, but I have great and many examples come to mind of those people that have kept fighting, kept contending, that have said, I'm willing to risk again. I'm willing to share with another person. I want to move forward. I don't want to stay here. And they have hope in the power and the glory in the gospel of God.